The more you read about a given person, the more likely you are to find something objectionable. Have you ever read a book or heard someone speak and thought, wow, that person's speaking to me. I agree with most of what they say. They seem really wise and they speak with conviction and, and you want to learn all about what they've written or listen to all their speeches and then you read a bit more about them as a person and you realize they're racist. H.P. Lovecraft comes to mind here, although Roald Dahl was always my favorite author until I realized he was a big-time anti-Semite until he died. I don't know how many dozens of famous men fell from grace a couple of years ago when they were exposed as sexual predators. Or J.K. Rowling is another obvious example of someone who squandered her popularity by spreading trans misogyny on Twitter. But the list could go on and on, because people are assholes. Yes, even your idols. I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. When I say your idols, I don't just mean the ones who bring tears to your eyes. It could be someone you listen to a lot and just don't question. Sometimes when we love one thing about a person, say their books or their movies, we like the whole person. We don't always separate their work from their personalities. The problem with that is we admire people, so we believe them, and we take their sides when they're wrong. We tend to see people we admire as wiser or more moral because of a bias called the halo effect. In fact, studies show just being good-looking makes the person seem more right. But no one is right about everything, and no one is above criticism. Not only are we not perfect, we're not even that good. What, everything you do is selfless and kind? Do you live everything you profess to value all the time? You're never an asshole, never a hypocrite? It's okay. We're all like that. But you can minimize being an asshole, you can change beliefs and behaviors that harm others, and you might even be able to make up for past behavior. Either way, we're all different kinds of imperfect, including the people up on the pedestal. Those people don't need a halo. I think you can enjoy their work while keeping their flaws in mind, personally, so, so even if I want to read Harry Potter again, J.K. Rowling is never getting another dollar from me. We could get deeper into a discussion about what to take from people and what to discard, if it's possible to keep the person's words and ignore their actions, and so on. We can discuss it in the comments if you like. But there are a lot of videos about that already. I liked the one that I linked to in the description. But I have other questions too. Like, why do we idolize certain people and not others? Why do we have idols at all? Do we need them? Idols can be sources of inspiration, but then what is it that inspires you? Their words? Their actions? Are their words really original? Are their actions all their own work? Like me, I speak for myself, but there have been a million influences on my thinking. And I can't acknowledge all of it because I'm just not aware of it all. One thing I've always tried to convey on this channel is until we unlearn them, most of our beliefs are given to us by other people. We don't even notice it. It happens gradually over our lives. If you're interested, watch my video on propaganda also linked in the description. One effect of propaganda that I didn't mention in that video, and in fact one cause of it, is many or most of our idols are chosen for us too. Why do we heroify athletes so much? Why do we want to know everything about the lives of actors and singers? Why do we admire rich people? Why are Jordan Peterson, Neil Ferguson, Sam Harris, and Steven Pinker the intellectuals we're supposed to listen to. Are they just smarter? I can think of a couple of reasons why, at least. Uh, they, they appear politically neutral because they stand for the status quo, but of course the status quo is not neutral. 
Then there's the effect of YouTube and TED. TED Talks, plus a thousand other forums that invite prestigious intellectuals to speak, record their speeches, and put them up on YouTube. YouTube's algorithms give you recommendations of more of the same kind of popular public figures. It's a feedback loop. Most of these people don't rock the boat, because if they did, they would get less publicity, fewer invitations to speak, lower book sales, and might even lose their jobs. Or if they do propose real changes, they get sidelined. In 2013, the news couldn't get enough of Malala Yousafzai because her story makes the Taliban look bad and makes the war on Afghanistan look good. I don't remember reading about her donating $50,000 to build schools in Gaza, or when she told Obama to cut out all the drone strikes. Did you know she was a socialist? Did you know Helen Keller was a socialist? Most Americans know that name too, but like Malala, not for the things she wanted to be remembered for. Nowadays, thanks to decades of activism, feminist and anti-racist writers are getting more attention. They might get a TED Talk of their own. That's good, I guess, but why weren't they allowed in the center of attention until recently? Because they would have rocked the boat. And yet, rocking the boat is the only thing that made their views popular enough. No longer on the radical fringe, but mainstream. Same goes for climate change. Now most people believe in it. We're allowed to hear from people like Greta Thunberg. I don't think she proposes anything particularly radical, but, but she's still young. There's still time for her to radicalize and lose favor with the ruling class. It's always been useful to trot out experts or witnesses or people you're supposed to identify with to reinforce propaganda. We've been raised on propaganda, so they're just telling us what we think already, so the message goes down smooth. As our beliefs are handed to us, the people who best communicate those beliefs to us become our idols. I think it's dangerous to idolize anyone because of the halo effect and how our critical faculties stop working. You can kill your idols by remembering they're normal people, just as corruptible by money and fame as anyone else, and just as wrong as anyone else, too. But I also think idolizing an individual does a disservice to all the unacknowledged influences on their thinking and their accomplishments. In a way, the individual is the culture expressing itself, thousands of voices and millions of memories coalescing in one brain. I'm not saying individuals are worthless or we shouldn't admire people, just that we should acknowledge where they and their ideas and their achievements come from. The more I read about history, the more I think our way of looking at individuals in history, namely the famous ones, kings, generals, that kind of thing, is wrong. Let's bear in mind history is, in effect, what historians say it is. There are a lot of things we can be pretty sure of, but most of what we know was written or commissioned by quote-unquote great men. There's archaeological evidence and witness accounts of things, so that's good to know all about, you know, so historians can develop a clearer picture of what happened, at least depending how much of it they know and choose to include. Like other intellectuals, many historians work at universities and other organizations connected with power. Of course, I wouldn't accuse all historians of lying or some other stereotype, just that if you want to go far in the academy, you don't challenge the structure on which it's built. But regardless of historians' biases and incentives, written accounts and most other evidence comes from people at the top of the social hierarchy. We can question what they say to an extent. I think it's fair to assume what they've said is largely self-serving. These benevolent kings and queens and aristocrats who were artists and scientists or patrons of the arts and scientists, where did they get their wealth and leisure from? How were the lives of the people who created it? They could have been geniuses too. 
Same goes for today as people struggle through poverty without the opportunity to become great. And in some ways, it makes sense for us to learn that great men are the movers of history because certain people made certain decisions, like, say, going to war to expand their territory, and history sees them as the heroes who won the war and united the country, or, or maybe the guy who discovered or invented that really useful thing. And I don't want to under, understate the value of uh, you know, those people recognized by history as geniuses. Sidney Hook pointed out the decisive role of such people when he said rhetorically, how many battalions are the equivalent of a Napoleon? How many minor poets will give us a Shakespeare? How many run-of-the-mind scientists will do the work of an Einstein? Yeah, it's a valid point, sure. It's just that there's so much more to their stories, and so many more stories that aren't told. Where did this genius come from? Why didn't everyone have the opportunity to develop their genius? Historians have access to documents and artifacts, but they don't have the whole context. Recently, there's been more of a push for a people's history or so-called history from below. The best known example being Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States. But it's often just easier for the historian to try to view history through the eyes of the great man, ignoring influences on them. But no, really, what were their influences? Like, was it really just that king's decision, or did he have a court who made the decision together? Who set up the power structure that he used to impose his will, and where did it derive its power from? What were the dominant religious or economic ideas of the time? Where did they come from? And for that matter, what was, what was their upbringing like? Emperors don't just materialize as fully formed adults, nor do they build armies without social conditions that enable them. Or what about the so-called founding fathers, the people who lifted the U.S. Constitution from the Iroquois? How many Americans think they're geniuses for writing it all by themselves? What about other great people from history? Did that artist paint all his pictures without any teachers or influences? Did the scientist discover those elements on his own in isolation, or did he just advance the science a bit so history gives him the credit? Did that inventor invent the thing all on his own, or did he have a team working for him? Or did he steal it? By the way, have you noticed I've only been using he that's because, apparently, there were no women in history. I don't know when they were invented. Haven't read about that either. The point is, to focus on one person is to ignore historical context. If they studied you 500 years from now, they might just look at what you said online. They wouldn't necessarily know anything about your parents, your friends, your teachers, the messages you've absorbed over the years from school and the media, etc. But that's where you come from. Sure, you make your own decisions, ultimately, but you don't make them in isolation from all those people around you and their beliefs and their assumptions. And that's what culture is. So it's a major weakness of many historians, and one that the rest of us will suffer from if we don't understand the wider context in which the person is acting. And it's not just about the past. I'm talking about history. We're living through history in real time, as you might say. So we ignore context in the present, too. Our culture is used to thinking in terms of the great man theory, believing stories about the fabled leader who came along at a time of crisis and saved our people, and waiting for the next one. The propaganda encourages this thinking, of course, because we're supposed to think of ourselves as the people on the bottom, the people who have no effect on history, who should follow great men who will save us. You see it in politics all the time. Obama promised hope and change, so people were mobilized in huge numbers to vote for it. They didn't do anything other than vote, even though tens of millions of people could have formed a movement that would actually do some good, like the general strike in India right now. Obama's supporters ignore most of what the guy did. 
And, and that's common among diehard fans of anyone, but it's a particular problem when someone has so much power and they're just called charming and articulate rather than the guy who terrorized people on the other side of the world. Let's see Ellen or Jerry Seinfeld ask about that instead of dancing and getting coffee. But why would they? They're rich. They're part of the same class. The ruling class tends to show a lot of solidarity, so they'll never ask the tough questions. The worst they'll do is make fun of Trump, which just reinforces the belief that we need someone else to tell us what to do. This great man thinking is even more obvious with the cult that formed around Donald Trump, of course. Trump supporters are so deep in a world of illusion, they think he's the second coming of Christ. They're willing to deny what's in front of their eyes if it makes him look bad. They were whipped up into a frenzy during the Obama years, mostly from reading and believing all kinds of nonsense about him, especially stuff that didn't matter. Like, I never saw them criticize Obama for all the people he killed, but they thought he was a Muslim and the Muslims are bad. Then Trump comes along with the perfect slogan for them, Make America Great Again as in erase all the things the black guys supposedly did. He started saying racist stuff in public, and next thing you know, millions of people will follow him to the end of the earth. He's saving them from, well, that's never specified. He's leading them to, well, it doesn't matter. Their imaginations do the work. That's the halo effect. We admire inventors or entrepreneurs, but their wealth and everything that gets created comes on the backs of millions and millions of people from the same time and earlier who made everything that was necessary for their success. Where do they get their money from? Where do they get their ideas from? Who made them come to life? Look at Elon Musk. Get a bunch of money from the government and give it to your employees to make civil and military engineering projects. Look at Bill Gates. Get your employees to make slightly better software and then vigorously enforce intellectual property laws. Look at Warren Buffett. Get a huge amount of money, do a bit of research, buy a huge amount of stock. Is it really ingenious to use money to make more money? Or there's George Soros, who made a billion dollars shorting the British pound. I know he's a controversial guy. Some people think he's behind all the protests and everything that right-wingers in the U.S. don't like, when that's mostly just in their imaginations. You should probably kill the devils in your heads, just like you kill the idols in your heads. To me, Soros is just another rich liberal. Rich liberals have their causes, but all they usually do is set up a foundation so they don't have to pay so much tax and get other people to donate to it. They say shit like, together we can beat cancer. No, you alone could beat cancer with your billions of dollars. You just choose not to. Is it really genius to know how capitalism works and use the system to make more money? People take what already exists and innovate a little and then patent the innovation and next thing you know they're billionaires. Millions of people before them discovered and built and recorded everything these guys ever needed to do what they did. And yet we give a few people exclusive legal use of the thing through intellectual property so they can be the only ones who make money off it and get any credit. We think of some people as particularly smart and persistent, but my guess is anyone could make a similar contribution if they just had the right conditions. But we don't all have the money to hire thousands of employees to make our vision come to life. We should have both a view of history and an economic system that reflects everyone's contribution, not, not just one that rewards owners. To solve the great man problem in capitalism, Peter Kropotkin proposed the following in The Conquest of Bread. The means of production being the collective work of humanity, the product should be the collective property of the human race. All belongs to all. All things are for all people since all people have need of them, since all people have worked in the measure of their strength to produce them, and since it is not possible to evaluate everyone's part in the production of the world's wealth. Nobody has the right to seize a single one of these machines and say, 
This is mine. If you want to use it, you must pay me a tax on each of your products. Any more than the feudal lord of medieval times had the right to say to the peasant, this hill, this meadow belong to me, and you must pay me a tax on every sheaf of corn you reap, on every rick you build. If the people bear their fair share of the work, they have a right to their fair share of all that is produced by all, and that share is enough to secure them well-being. Once you shatter this illusion of the rare genius and see them as ordinary people with better opportunities, you can begin to see the systems they grew up and worked in, and you can begin to see history not as the product of the work of a few, but of countless people who just didn't get their own TED Talk. That's not to say the rare genius doesn't exist, it's just that it doesn't exist in isolation. If you want to be more like your image of your hero, that's great. Just remember, the person might not have been so heroic. That shouldn't dampen your commitment to your cause and your goals. Thanks.